This case study is about a one-day-old baby girl who needs to be further evaluated because she turns blue when she cries. Um, she was a uncomplicated term birth to a new mom, Gravita 1 Para 0, who had no familial history of heart disease. The baby's bod um, full body examination showed a, a systolic murmur, but really no other abnormal findings. So to further diagnose, there were different tests that were done, such as an echo and an ECG and a chest film, and there showed no cardiac enlargement. Although pulmonary vascular markings were diminished, there was right ventricular hypertrophy as well as a large VSD, a large aorta, and very small pulmonary arteries, which in turn caused a severe pressure gradient across the pulmonic valve. Due to these different findings pointing towards tetralogy of Fallot, the infant was started on prostaglandin E1 infusion, which keeps her patent ductus arteriosus open so that she can have a better blood flow to ensure that she's getting enough blood to her lungs. They did a palliative surgery and then later on at eight months of age she went for the full reconstructive surgery and came out with no complications. The article I found talked about Tetralogy of Fallot in its entirety, but I wanted to focus on the treatment and at-home management of the disease. For symptomatic babies who are born and diagnosed with Tetralogy of Fallot, a prostaglandin infusion um, is many times initiated to maintain and preserve the PDA and make sure that it's open to allow a stable source of blood flow to the lungs due to the pulmonic stenosis and its severity. There are two options. There is the palliation option, and then there's the full surgical repair. The palliation avoids cardiopulmonary bypass surgery and establishes a secure source of blood flow to the lungs without having the neonate go under bypass. And usually they use a Blalock tossing shunt, which is just a prosthetic tube that's placed inside the um, in between the systemic and pulmonary artery to ensure an adequate amount of blood flow is getting through. The full, um, the complete repair many times consists of closing the VSD and then channeling the left ventricle to the aortic root and sometimes um, the pulmonary obstruction will have to be relieved as well as reconstruction of pulmonary arteries depending on how severe the case is. The controversy when it comes to which option is best is a question of timing. Um, many patients who undergo the complete repair during the neonatal period, which is the first 28 days of life, are unlikely to require more than one intervention in the first year of life. However, there is question about the neuro neurological outcomes of a neonate going under bypass surgery. And one quote that I found in the article that I thought was very interesting is it talked about the effect of cardiopulmonary bypass on the neonatal brain is um, associated with um, a greater risk of neurological events and abnormal neurological findings on follow-up after the surgery. And studies have shown that the neurodevelopmental outcomes of neonates undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass compared to older children have shown lower intelligence quotients in patients exposed to bypass as neonates. So although the baby in the case study did receive both, she received palliative and then the full repair Many places will do that, well, they'll do the palliative care and then do a complete repair in four to six months. Sometimes, depending on the severity or different defects, it could be at um, eight to 12 months. And for those patients who are given the palliative or are giving a waiting period in order to kind of delay going under cardiopulmonary bypass, at-home management was recommended of need a chest position during TET spells or periods of cyanotic events. And sometimes babies were given small doses of propanolol to reduce spasms that are many times the cause of TET spells. The article was very interesting, and I'm interested to kind of see the different aspects and perceptions of surgical timing and 
what is beneficial for long-term outcome of these patients. This is really interesting. I never really um, looked much into this topic, but I know being a neonate nurse um, in the NICU that you probably have seen this. I was just curious um, if you have seen Catality of Flow in your workplace, what do the parents usually go with as far as palliation versus bypass? Um, also with the palliation, how exactly do they go about that process of inserting this stent and are there risk? I mean, obviously, there's risk factors with everything, but are there risk factors for neurodevelopment um, decline after that as well as there is with the bypass? Um, I was just curious to see your take as a NICU nurse if you've been able to see this done um, in your hospital. Oh, that's a very interesting insight on uh, in this topic. Um, just far from my specialty, but much more effort up your alley. Uh, so my comments are, though, with symptomatic tetralo tet uh, tetralogy of flow um, needing treatment with either the Blaylock tossing shunt, uh, which is pretty interesting to look up, by the way, or with the bypass surgery to repair the defects, how often are you seeing kids um, who are kind of asymptomatic uh, long enough where they don't need to have the, the shunt at all and they just go right into a bypass surgery because uh, they're better candidates for it at that age? Uh, and then also when, what I was looking up is this Blaylock tossing shunt. It was reminding me a lot of the other uh, cardiac abnormality kids see the, the uh, patent ductus arteriosus where you know, the, the aorta and the pulmonary vessels are, are still attached or install that open duct. It looked like when they attached this, this shunt from the carotid to the pulmonary vessels, it kind of looked like it created that same open air or open blood flow in the same sense. So I was wondering if the symptoms kids have after the shunt are similar to kids with patent ductus arteriosus, if, if you knew anything about that, or if I'm even on the right page. Dana or Alex, whichever you want. Um, you're actually completely right. When we have kids with tetralogy of flow, most of the time they're on they either, if, they're, if they've been asymptomatic for a while, which we do see a lot, usually the only thing that you see, unless it's a really severe case, is they just have an extremely loud murmur, and we can kind of hold off on the surgery. Um, the kids, most of the time, have to have a HEP block in, regardless of if they need IV fluid at all, because they need an access to being able to give them prostaglandins to keep their PDAs open because with premature babies, although the PDA is supposed to close within a few hours, with preemies it could take days if not longer than that. And with a kid with tetralogy of flow, you actually need that PDA to stay open because of the pulmonic stenosis. It is one of the only stable ways to ensure that there's going to be blood flow that gets to the lungs. And so we actually have, um, we actually put in HEP blocks to ensure that we have um, IV access so that we can give prostaglandins if a baby were to go under one of these TET spells where they became cyanotic, that we could give the prostaglandins, open that PDA, and keep it open long enough so that we can ensure that enough blood flow gets to the lungs. This article talked about chromosome 22Q11 and more so the deletion of this chromosome and the cardiac anomaly implications that that has. It focused on um, patients that had conotruncal anomaly face syndrome, which means that they have a dysmorphic face as well as some sort of congenital heart defect. In 60 patients that they were looking at that had the deletion of this chromosome that had conotruncal anomaly face syndrome, there were, let me see, there were 60 patients in total, 28 patients had tetralogy of Fallot. So that was 47% of the patients with this syndrome and with the deletion of this chromosome that also had tetralogy of Fallot as their cardiac defect. Chromosome 22Q11 deletion is also associated with a couple other syndromes, one of them being Catch-22, which involves cardiac defects, the abnormal face, 
thymic hypoplasia, cleft palate, and hypocalcemia. The patients, the 28 patients that they had with Tetralogy of Fallot, they only had the face and the Tetralogy of Fallot, and they did not have the hypocalcemia or the thymic hypoplasia. There were two patients in the group that did have a cleft palate, however. The main um, point of the article was kind of to shed light on the cardiovascular anomalies in Tetralogy of Fallot that are associated with the chromosome deletion in comparison to patients that have Tetralogy of Fallot but do not have the deletion of this chromosome, which was kind of con considered the control group, and they had no additional syndrome. There were only 22 patients with the deletion in Tetralogy of Fallot that had um, the imaging records that were required for the study, and so 22 patients for the control group were chosen. In the 22 patients that had the deletion, every single one had some sort of learning disability, as well as every single one had at least one additional cardiac anomaly. In the control group, without the deletion of this chromosome, it ranged from zero to two additional cardiac anomalies. There were certain anomalies that were associated only with um, patients that had the deletion of this chromosome, such as major aortopulmonary collateral artery, aberrant subclavian artery, isolation of the subclavian artery, and isolation of the pulmonary artery. These were not found at all in the group that had no deletion of the chromosome. When talking more about the deletion of the chromosome and the different syndromes that it's associated with, something that was brought up at the end was the idea of abnormal neural crest cells. And there is a suggestion that neural crest cells are contributing to the formation of early embryonic truncus and arches. And these crest cells are just... Um, they are just cells that arise from the ectoderm of the neural tube. So while an embryo is forming, these cells are all around, and they end up migrating and differentiating into different types of cells and become parts of all different systems in the body. So they can end up being teeth cells and skin cells and face cells and heart cells. And so there's this suggestion that this abnormality in crest cells and these cells are turning into the trunk and arch cells of the heart and causing these defects is something that's being looked at and studied a little bit more. And the major suggestions with patients that are found to have this deletion is to um, acquire genetic counseling to kind of look at the possibilities of cardiac anomalies, whether it be this conotruncal anomaly face syndrome to the extent of catch-22, which involves a lot more complications. The study looked at the relationship between maternal obesity and cardiovascular defects in infants. Um, it did mention Tetralogy of Fallot as one of them, but the article kind of was more of an overarching cardiovascular defects as a whole to kind of look at the relationship between those two factors. Um, it was a large case control study based on 6,801 infants born with a congenital heart defect in Sweden. and. They used the Swedish Medical Birth Registry to get information on both the births and diagnoses of the babies as well as mother's information that was acquired from maternity health care centers. Um, in the beginning, it was saying the total prevalence of birth um, cardiovascular defects is estimated to be nine, 7 to 9 per 1,000 births. In the study, um, BMI was used as a measurement for obesity. Maternal obesity was defined as BMI that is greater than 29, whereas morbidly obese was defined as a BMI greater than 35. They did exclude infants that had any type of chromosomal anomalies, as well as infants that were born to mothers with diabetes because of the already known associations between those factors and cardiovascular malformations. Um, after looking at everything and looking at um, the BMI and the diagnoses of these babies, there was a positive correlation found between maternal obesity and an increased risk of cardiovascular defects. They found a slightly increased risk for infants um, for the overweight group, which was a BMI of 26.1 to 29, but the maternal obesity group and the morbidly obese group showed a significant um, risk and increased risk for 
cardiovascular defects in offspring. Although there was um, information that showed that this could be clinically significant, the statistical aspect of it only proved that BSDs and ASDs reached statistical significance for the study that had an increased risk due to obesity. It did mention tetralogy below. It did not reach statistical significance, but it was a factor and there were a couple hundred babies. The study explained that an even larger study would be required to evaluate the association, which is interesting because of the fact that the study was already so large. Um, they tried to explain a couple of possible associations between um, obesity and the cardiovascular defects, and one explanation is the possibility that during the time period where these neuro, um, not neurological, these developmental defects develop is 14 to 60 days post conception, and during that time period, there may be um, undetected type 2 diabetes that kind of flies under the radar, which is already known because of impaired glucose metabolism to be at an increased risk for congenital heart defects in children. Another explanation that was proposed was the idea of the nutritional aspect of obesity and the possible deficiency of folic acid, which was pretty far-fetched, and the data showed that after looking at the folic acid supplementation of these women, it gave no support for the association whatsoever. Although there was a positive correlation, it is something that can't necessarily be proven statistically significant for tetralogy of fulla, but it's definitely something to think about when it comes to um, taking care of yourself as a mom during especially those um, critical periods of this 14 to 60 days post-conception where these developmental defects are at the greatest risk of happening. Due to the fact that we have a lot more people that were born with congenital heart disease living on into adulthood and parenthood, this study wanted to look at the effect of congenital heart defects, which have been assumed to have a multifactorial etiology, and it was testing to kind of see the familial aspect of that. This prospective study looked at the pediatric surgical records traced through the National Health Service in the UK. 1,094 patients were identified as people who were born with um, congenital cardiac defects and underwent a major cardiac surgery before 1970. They, after the inclusion and exclusion criteria, which was made up of the inclusion was you had to be born before 1970, you had to be a resident in the United Kingdom, you had to have a major heart defect, which they considered to be abnormal situs, situs or atrioventricular or ventriculoarterial connection, an ASD or tetralogy of fallow. And another inclusion was you had to have palliative or corrective surgery, including atrial septectomy. Exclusion was death during childhood or significant learning disability. So after kind of the inclusion and exclusion, 727 people remained in the study and ended up having 393 live offspring. There were 71 miscarriages, four terminations for social reasons, and one therapeutic termination. After looking at the records, 16 live offspring from the 393 live-born infants were born with a cardiac malformation, and that kind of represented a total recurrence risk of 4.1%. It was found that there were more congenital heart defects that occurred in offspring when the mom was affected rather than when simply dad was affected. And it was also shown that an excess of miscarriages was observed in offspring where mom was affected with a cardiac malformation. When looking at specifically tetralogy of Fallot, heart defects occurred in seven of the 223 offspring that had that, which was 3.1%. There was a less correlation between siblings having it, which was 2.2%. Um, 
And then it looked at second degree relatives and third degree relatives, which became 0.3 and also 0.3%. So it kind of looked at um, just to kind of see what the recurrence effect was. It, they said that our findings do not support a polygenic basis for all heart defects. Um, it talked about ASD seemed to be a single gene defect and tetralogy of flow is a polygenic disorder. Um, there were different risks depending on whether it was um, just a mom had it or a sibling had it or a relative that was farther down the line had it, but it did show overall this recurrence risk of 4.1% and a sibling risk of 2.1% for congenital heart defects. This final article talks about the correlation between congenital heart defects and maternal multivitamin use. The data was collected from a case control study done in Atlanta, Georgia. There were two groups, the case infants and the control infants. The case infants, their data was collected from the Metropolitan Atlanta Congenital Defects Program, whereas the control infants, um, their data was gathered from a 1% stratified random sample of infants that were born during the same period of time, which was in 1982 to 1983. After they were given their either case or control group settings, they were separate. The case infants were further separated into groups. There was three groups. One was the isolated, and that was if a baby had a cardiac defect, and that was the only major anomaly they had. There was multiple, and that is if the cardiac defect was a part of a group of other anomalies of unknown causes. And the last one was syndromic, if the cardiac defect was related to a genetic or teratinogenic um, syndrome, such as trisomy 21 or congenital rubella. Uh, they obtained the information on the vitamin use through a phone interview. Mothers were asked three questions. The first one was, do you use any vitamins regularly? And using a vitamin regularly was considered using it three times a week. They asked if they used um, any vitamins regularly in the three-month period before being pregnant and three months into the pregnancy, so there was a six-month window. If, um, if the mother said yes, they asked what type of vitamin to kind of look at specifically either multivitamins or single vitamins, just, just, such as just vitamin A or vitamin C. And the third was, in which months during the period above that we had just mentioned did you take these vitamins? So some may have taken it when they got pregnant, two months into pregnancy, only before, and so they wanted to look at the specific time period of use. Uh, the mothers were then further classified in two groups. Of one were non-users, which reported using no vitamins at all during the six-month period. Second group was called periconceptual users, where um, mothers took the vitamins during the entire six month period regularly. Early postconceptual users were mothers who took vitamins during the first three months of pregnancy. Late, late postconceptual users were mothers who took vitamins only from the second to third month in pregnancy. And the fifth group were just considered other users and they reported discontinuous use where there was really no rhyme or reason or any type of format for them taking it. Um, the major comparison groups out of these groups were really just one and two because they wanted to look at the effect of multivitamin use in women during the sensitive period of heart development, which is the first three months of pregnancy, and compare it to non-users. Out of the uh, 1,049 cases of cardiac defects that were collected, 91 were related to syndrome, so 958 cases were the remaining base for the report. The results showed that uh, pericon <clears throat> periconceptual vitamin use displayed a 24% decreased risk of cardiac defects, and the strongest reduction was focused on VSDs or ventricular septal defects and outflow tract defects. The, they also compared the group that showed women who did the 
post, late post-conceptual users, which was when they only took it during the second and third month of pregnancy and compared it to mothers who used no vitamins at all. And that also showed a... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It did not... It didn't change at all. The rest did not change. So the women who took vitamins during the second and third month of pregnancy truly had no difference compared to mothers who did not use any vitamins at all. So the article ended up talking mainly about the fact that the timing of vitamin use was critical and that this sensitive period of the first three months of pregnancy is a vital time where vitamins should be taken. And there were also confounding factors that were talked about, whether it was race or um, maternal obesity or diabetes or smoking or hypertension that could have played a part, but the interesting quote at the end of the article said, if the association is causal, approximately one in four major cardiac defects could be prevented by multivitamin use.